The name of this book, as explained on the very first page, comes from this image of two women performing a ritual with the moon. This came from ancient Greece in the 2nd century BCE. Welcome, I am Francisco, and here are my five lessons that I learned from this book. If you're a pagan or a witch, I recommend you to get Drawing Down the Moon by Margot Adler. It's a long book, so let's get right into it. First lesson was about neo-paganism in America. It's really, really hard to define, but the one thing that most neo-pagans have in common is polytheism. This is the belief in or the worship of more than one god. Quoting from the book, a polytheistic worldview makes self-delusion harder. Deities are seen on a more symbolic and complex level. The gods are really the components of our psyches. They are generally unrecognized because our culture is not in harmony with them. So there are many, many gods. How many? Infinite amounts of them. So this makes us more open-minded, more tolerant. I believe in unity, in diversity. So one quote from the book is that the diversity of the gods commands a deep commitment to human diversity. Another thing is earth-centered. It means to preserve the earth, to worship the earth, nature, and the fertility deities. Neopagans have many gods, and some gods have to do with nature. But they are equally comfortable with the scientific discourse and magic ritual. So if you're a neopagan, you might be a witch. What is a witch? There are many definitions, and none is final. I have made a separate video on this topic, The Old Religion. In 1921, Margaret Murray published the book The Witch Cult. She described an ancient organized religion of witches. Some of the main aspects of these religions were the covens, the Sabbath celebrations, and worshipping a horned god. Other authors like Robert Graves, Charles Leland contributed to this view, bringing it into neo-paganism. According to historians, however, there was never a unified European-wide old religion. The horned god looks a lot like what the Inquisition labeled satanic, and from that we get the image of the witch as a villain. She flies on a broom, she practices incest, cannibalism, and causes all sorts of harm by occult means. But this stereotype was inspired by very old folk beliefs and exalted during the witch trials in Europe. Because the Inquisition took confessions under torture, it's likely that most stories about witches that we know today were fabricated. In any way, the book says there's no such thing as an unbroken tradition of witchcraft in Europe. The author divides the types of witches that we can find today in neoclassical, neo-pagan, feminist, ethnic, and neo-gothic witches, among other categories. You can see the numbers here. The classical craft has no elaborate initiations. It has very little ritual and is mostly oral. It's orally transmitted. In fact, the book says that the influence of high magic is fairly new in the craft. It also says that dogma is the worst thing you can have in the craft. It doesn't matter whether your tradition is 40,000 years old or whether it was created last week. Most people join the craft and not a tradition. Another quote I liked was, The detail of form doesn't matter, but the spirit and whether it works. That means whether it works for you. In 1974, the American Council of Witches attempted to define witchcraft, mostly to dispel the sensationalist image pushed by the media. The problem was that doing this involves a degree of centralization. It was a big struggle, but the conclusions were that the craft is not a single entity. Each coven is autonomous. And different covens have different symbologies, different gods and goddesses, and different rituals and requirements. So there's really no dogma. The beautiful creativity which is happening in us is more important than all the old texts. That's why Wicca is flexible. It's religion without the middleman. 
Moving on, we see that the goddess aspect is one of the key features of neo-paganism. Most Wiccan traditions honor both female and male deities. So the female aspect of the divinity is just as essential as the male aspect. However, I feel it's important to mention the Dianic tradition and its influence. Historically, the term comes from Margaret Mary, who described witchcraft as the Dianic cult. It was a religion focused on Diana, or Aradia, derived from supposed rural Italian folk practices. These claims were never uh, confirmed. They actually were refuted by historians, but the legacy lives on. Dianic today means any tradition with an emphasis on the goddess. The first Dianic weekend group was started by Sid Budapest, meaning that there is one goddess who contains all goddesses. She is seen as the source of all living things and containing all that is within her. This was controversial for a couple of different reasons. First of all, it sounds a little bit monotheistic, so it only differs in gender from the religions that most modern pagans have rejected. As mentioned before, polytheism is one of the strengths of the craft. And the other thing is that it was women only, so many of these groups did not accept men or even transgender women. According to the author, the second wave of feminism reinforced the idea that witchcraft is a religion and a practice rooted in rebellion. So this showed that the craft can be political and spiritual at once. Today, much of cultural feminism has been assimilated by mainstream pagan groups, and there are many traditions that welcome men but still exalt the feminine. And the last lesson I learned from this book is about ritual magic. Is it a supernatural thing? Apparently not. According to the book, most witches and neo-pagans do not link magic with the supernatural. There are many definitions of magic, but it's something that works by alternating faith and skepticism. It is ever evolving and dynamic. All faiths and dogmas represent a point where magic stopped. Personally, I like this definition, which is very psychological. It says magic is the development of techniques that allow communication with hidden portions of the self and with hidden portions of all other islands in this psychic sea. Yet most pagans might agree with the definition by Aleister Crowley. He says, magic is the art of causing change to occur in conformity with will. Another definition from the book is about what is a ritual of magic. A ritual is a sequence of events, but not dry, formalized or repetitive. Instead, it's when emotions are aroused, increased, built to a peak, rising the energy, and then aimed and fired at a goal. The purpose is to put us in an altered state within which we can access and control our psychic talents. Also to end the alienation from nature and from each other. In conclusion, the craft is a dynamic place of visionary art which is anti-authoritarian, it demands creativity, it lacks dogma, and ritual is first, myth is second, according to the book. You can worship even without believing. Thanks for watching. Stay tuned and subscribe for more videos like this one. If you don't like Wicca, remember that Wicca was very influential in all currents of neo-paganism today. So still, it's good to learn about it. Many blessings and have a wonderful day.